so I have the pleasure of having uh, Bozida Radunovic, who's one of my colleagues, and we've been working together for the last four years. Uh, Bozida did his PhD in EPFL Switzerland, and then he did his mm -hmm. postdoc in ENS Paris. All good, yeah. All good. <laughs> and uh, then he joined uh, uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, and uh, you must have, you probably remember still uh, the Sura platform and how Kuhn developed the software defined radio. And he did say that uh, it's going, uh, Bozidar is going to make it easier to program. So Bozidar is going to talk about this uh, wireless programming language, Zyra. I don't know, is, did I pronounce it right? We, we were calling it Zyria, but maybe Zyria is okay. easier. Zyria or Zyra, <coughs> Zyria, whatever. Yeah, so this language uh, lets you uh, develop these uh, wireless protocols and implement them on software-defined radios at a high-level language. Uh, so I'll hand thanks. it over to Buzi there now. Thanks for the uh, introduction and uh, thanks for your applause. Thank you for introducing me and for inviting me. And uh, yeah, so um, this is a kind of a gear shift from Markov chains to compilers. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. To have a, it's a summer school, you know, it should, should be diverse, you should hear different things. That's what I was hoping for. And then they approved my kind of general title, so there you are. Uh, <coughs> okay, so the high level, so it's four hours, it's quite a lot of uh, talking, so I'll try to have some demos and examples. I was hoping that uh, maybe you can do some demos on your laptops yourself, but actually um, it's not trivial to install it in these few hours that I'm here, and we didn't manage to do it before. So all these examples that you'll see are online, and, I'll, and basically there was the website here. So the whole thing is open source. You can find it on GitHub. There's a link here. And I will post these examples online of everything that I'll present here in the code so that you can actually play with it and uh, do the things yourself afterwards. right? And uh, maybe even tonight. I'm not sure if I'll put them out tonight for tomorrow, but from there on. Uh, <coughs> OK, so uh, this is the ha overview uh, of the talk. So first, I'm going to give you an introduction. Why are we interested in this? Why do I talk to you about compilers now when you're, we came here for wireless? And then I'm going to tell you about the programming language we created to uh, facilitate programming wireless devices and doing the uh, cool wireless research. Then a bit about compilation execution, which is very high level overview uh, from my point of view. And I'm a wireless uh, networking guy, not a compiler guy. So I learned lots of interesting things. It was quite exciting. And try to explain you some high level things. How do we do these things? How do we make it work efficiently and so on? Hopefully it's interesting. Then I'm going to give you a, a case study of Wi-Fi design. So another thing is I don't really know what you heard last week exactly. So I know roughly the title. So I think I heard that you didn't really discuss the Wi-Fi design. So Wi-Fi design is something kind of which is well known now, but I guess maybe not for everyone here. And so I want to introduce you and, and give you a brief idea of why Wi-Fi, how Wi-Fi is designed, and why is it designed a physical air? Why is it designed as it is designed? So basically, it's below what you heard in, in, the, in the morning. And then allow you to build your own Wi-Fi, change it, and you know, play with the physical air. Hopefully, once you understand these few basic things, you can then go on and explore and build your own interesting research on the top of it. Right? And then some conclusions, right? <coughs> and uh, I'm not yet sure about the timing, so basically, I have a lot of slides, so we'll see how it goes. Feel free to ask, interrupt with questions, anything, and then I have some time for tomorrow to adjust the slides if, if, uh, if, if it's needed, right? OK, so again, the first question I should answer is, why this course? Why do I talk to you about uh, languages and compilers? So uh, there's lots of innovation on physical air and Mac design, right? Uh, if you look at the papers, for example, in conferences, there's um, uh, software-defined radios, which are like Sora, you heard about. Radius you can program and you can implement your own algorithms at a very low level so that you can um, design different networks, right? And uh, uh, the problem here is that modern physical layers, they require uh, high uh, rate signal processing, high rate digital signal processing. So I guess you heard about it in Kuhn's talk about Sora, but you need to do uh, receive samples at 40 megahertz, uh, 40 mega samples a second in order to achieve the full rate of uh, Wi-Fi. So basically, you need to be very, uh, uh, very fast when you get these samples. And you need to think about, carefully about the hardware you will be using, about the programming methods you'll be using, about optimization and all that. And then it becomes very difficult to, for a, a, a regular human, in, and in particular for a, a young student who is just emerging in the area, uh, is to kind of uh, understand all these things. right? So you need to learn about uh, signal processing algorithms. You need to learn about. Uh, 
uh, networking of, the, of it, but you also need to learn, learn uh, how do you get this hardware to work, how do you program it, how do you optimize. So, um, so, this, uh, so the, the first example that was kind of uh, simplifying this is a GNU radio, which is a thing which is, you have everything in MATLAB, you can implement things in MATLAB, you have C code as well. You can write your waveforms in MATLAB, you can send them, you receive another radio, you see what happens, and you can really play only with algorithms in, 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 uh, in MATLAB. But the radio is there, nicely interface. But the problem with new radio is that these things are then slow. So you can create, create your form, uh, waveform offline, you can send it, you can do experiments. I suppose you did something like that in, in Warp. On, so you were just doing sending things, receiving, and then analyzing what is there. But that's the first step. If you want to build the whole platform, right, you need to do a real-time thing. If you want to run on the top of it some cool application, TCP, whatever it is, you need to do that. You, know, you need to do it really fast, right? Otherwise, the whole system is different. So there are platforms like Sora and Warp, which, are, which are team achieve uh, the processing requirement, which can do it very fast. But then the problem is that uh, <coughs> it's very difficult to write code for these platforms. And I'll discuss a little bit more later. Uh, and requires lots of optimization. So this is the kind of a state of the art today. And so, so in particular for different hardware platforms, so one example is the CPU platform with Sora. Right? So you can do lots of things in CPU. The nice thing is it's very programmable. So you, know, you can write a C code, and you, can, you, you kind of all know how to write C code. right? So you can write C code, even MATLAB code. But if you want to write fast C code, then you need to write the fast C code using the tricks that Kun was presenting. right? So you probably need to care about vectorizing uh, how fast you're going to, how much you're going to, how are you going to transfer data. You will want to create lookup tables. You want to worry about cache sizes, function inlining, lots of stuff there, right? So if you really want to make it respect the thing. So, it's, so they build this platform on top of it, which you heard about, which is kind of making these things easier to program. But I still find it difficult. And I'll tell you a little bit about why I find it still difficult. The other sort of platform is FPGA platform. Uh, how many of you have programmed FPGAs before? OK, there's some still, right? So for those of you who have, you know it's kind of quite painful, painful process. And uh, depends which tools do you use. Uh, so it's, it's, again, difficult. You need to learn how to do digital design. And then from there, you need to move into algorithms. And you need to worry about all sorts of things that come in the interaction of the two. Uh, and then the other problem is that <coughs> portability and readability. So, you know, I'll give you a code which is written for, uh, in Verilog or in, uh, for FPGA or in Simulink for FPGA, and you see a bunch of these blocks, and you, you look at them, and you figure out, you're trying to figure out what they mean, right? So also, you want to interface this code, right? So what is the interface? You design, in particular for FPGA, right? You want to, you see some wires going in and out, but there are many implicit assumptions about clocks, synchronization, and a lot of things. So if you really want to port these things, it's, it's incredibly difficult. So, uh, and it's impossible to, pretty much to move one platform, one code from one platform to the other. So you cannot compare results, you cannot reuse some codes, and so on. So there are all these kind of things uh, that it's uh, difficult to uh, write and reuse code. And that, that is the main thing. If you look at the uh, popular open source platform now, one of the reasons for uh, such a, a development of, of software engineering and so on is because you have all these open source platforms you can build on, you can merge, you can you know, improve, and you don't have to do everything from scratch. And right now, pretty much in, in wireless physical air design, you're still down at doing everything from scratch. So that's the main uh, problem. So <coughs> I guess uh, I already told you about the platforms. Uh, so there are several other FPGA platforms, like this AirBlue from uh, MIT, where they actually tried to use a different programming model, uh, relying on a programming language for FPGAs, which is high level, called BlueSpec. Uh, then, but uh, that one uh, is still has some assumptions about it's difficult to port. There are other CPU-based platforms. So sorry, you heard a lot about it. There's an interesting uh, initiative I found out about recently. It's basically um, uh, guys that built uh, radios for configurable radios. They produced an open source uh, PCB board, so an open source hardware layout that allows you to build your own radio platform, interface with their chips, and make this process streamline this process. So doing that. There's a lots of now companies, small companies, that come out with their own radio. So you can buy these radios for a few hundred dollars. So uh, there's something like new radio, but there's much more uh, diversity, different form factors, different uses, lots of code. So this is interesting from the hardware point of view. So from our point of view of the programming, we would like to, to be able to program any platform. And ideally, you want to write your code once, and you just port it to any platform. And that's kind of a very high-level goal. 
which we haven't achieved yet, and there are lots of details I'll discuss on the way, but we are uh, a step closer there with, with this kind of design issue. So basically the thing is you can have lots of various hardwares. You don't want to be fo strictly fixed to one, and you want to be able to compare results with others and so on. So <laughs> let me give you a bit more uh, intuition what's wrong with the current tools. right? Because if we are designing a new tool and trying to persuade you that this is a, a useful thing, uh, so let me go over the existing tools. So <coughs> for uh, FPGAs, obviously you can first um, use uh, uh, Verilog and VHDL, and that's kind of um, uh, very low level and also very usually very uh, fixed to a specific FPGA you want to target and so on. There are some portable tools. These are commercial ones. There are lots of research behind there. You can use Simulink and LabVIEW, which will allow you to write some code. But this is also very, uh, this is not really portable. So if you so I've been working with this Simulink thing. So if you, if you want to design Simulink for, for, for Xilinx FPGA, you actually use Xilinx blocks, and you just connect the wires. So it is almost like Verilog programming. It looks like you, know, you have some kind of portable thing, but it's not much portable. Once you write the code, if you want it to compile there, you have to write it for Xilinx, and you have to understand digital design. Uh, there's lots of the CPU-based uh, tools, like you heard about Sora, and then uh, GNU Ready, and so on. Uh, and that's written in C, C++, and Python. There's lots of low-level optimization that have to happen. Um, there's like uh, control and data plane separation idea, a uh, couple of projects, and this, these are research projects still not really, still haven't picked up too much. And there are some uh, domain-specific languages, and I'll tell you about it. What we are doing is writing a domain-specific language. And uh, <coughs> this is just a state of the art, so none of this is picked up, and I mean, I think, uh, uh, I don't want to go into details about comparing our work with previous works. I, I'm happy to do that at the end once I explain you what it is, if you're interested. But this is just a kind of a current layout. And uh, so in high level, what the issues are is that the programming assumption is usually tied to the execution model. So you have to assume something about how you execute your code and you put it in the design. And that's not necessarily good if you want to port it to different platforms, if you want to optimize your, your, your performance and so on. Then uh, verbose programming. Uh, you have to write a lot of code and to write the simple functions, and that becomes quite difficult. And I'll give you uh, more details about each one of this in the following slides. There's shape state and low-level uh, optimizations. And um, I'll illustrate all these example, examples in Sora code, and luckily you've seen a little bit of it, so at least you know what is it all about. Uh, and again, I mean, stop me with questions if I'm too fast or not, um, not detailed enough in any of these. <coughs> so, um, so here is a running example. Uh, of a Wi-Fi receiver. This is a high-level scheme, and uh, I will explain you how Wi-Fi receiver works in the second part of the talk. And the reason is that um, I want to first introduce you the language so we can actually do some examples and run the code and see why do we design it like we do. So uh, forgive me for not going into details of these blocks, but you can still ask me questions now if you want. So I'll just give you a high-level overview. So basically, the first thing we do, we take the input samples from the radio. So this is uh, here you can imagine data coming directly from your radio card, from your um, analog to digital converter. You get them at a very high, high data rate, like um, 40 megahertz, mega samples per second. So 40 mega samples per second in Sora uh, terms, each sample is a complex number of 16 bits, each real and imaginary. This is 4 bytes per sample. So this is 140 megabytes per second, right? So that's the rate of the speed of data you get in there. But I think Kuhn mentioned that probably. So that's the, what happens here. <laughs> so then what you do, first you kind of go and detect carrier. You're looking for the packet. So you're looking for preamble. Once you find this preamble, you say, OK, I found, I'm done the preamble. So I do channel estimation. So I process some header, and I figure out what is in the header and how do I process it. And once I've picked up the channel, then I go and send this channel info next to the actual receiver. But this part of the receiver just receives header. right? So it's the first 48 bytes of a packet, which describe pretty much what is in the rest of the packet. So this bit here has like the channel inversion, which is now using this information to the inverse channel and explain you why you have to do this later. And then it decodes header and says, oh, this packet is encoded at a data rate of 54 uh, Mbps. So then it sends this information to the next bit, which is then the actual decoder, which is going to decode the rest of the packet. Now, because the, the encoding rate is different, we need different blocks. right? So. So basically, the data comes here, going to the tech carrier, and then kind of moves here, and then every, uh, something goes to this bit, and then everything moves here until the packet is decoded, and then you start receiving there. There is a kind of a flow of information. 
And uh, again, I'll explain this in more details as the talk goes on. Uh, so the first question uh, to ask here is, if you implement this on the CPU, how do you execute this? Right. So for example, I give you, you've received one complex number. So you might do remove DC on this complex number, and you get some output. So what do you do next? Do you send this complex number here, and you execute this one, or you take a new complex number and put it in here? You have a single CPU, for example. What will you do? Well, it's kind of unclear. You have to make a decision, right? Or once you get this one here, do you then, uh, or if you're in this line here, do you first go send one, one item all the way through, or you first execute a few here and then a few here, right? But then if you want to execute a few here, right, you might be wrong because maybe something else will happen there which will send you off. So the point of this should be that um, you, there are two things to specify here, right? The first thing I specified is the functionality. So I told you what I want to do. And hopefully that was clear, right? You understood where that has to go. And if I give you this in with a bit more details, you'll understand the functionality. But that's not enough to explain how will you program this on a CPU in, say, Sora. <clears throat> so to do that, you need to actually design a schedule or execution model. How do you execute this on CPU? And currently, you write both of these in your code, right? So the problem with that is if you want to change the execution model, you need to rewrite your code in and, and many places, right? And that is difficult because, you know, for example, if you want to change architecture, you want to have two CPUs or something, uh, it's not, there are some things that are easy to answer, but that's a general problem there, is if you want to change things like that. So the key, one of the questions we need to understand how to write is how to define this execution model. Okay, so the next thing is, um, is about state. So typically what, um, what, uh, what people do is like, um, well, they design this kind of notion of uh, vertices in data flow graph. So each vertex, is, as previous slides, is processing some data and sending data further on. And then this data gets processed and so on. Now, um, suppose we want to send some message uh, which is going back from this node to this node, right? Um, when is this message going to be received in terms of our execution plan? So how is it going to affect the data you receive? It's, that's something that needs to be defined again, related to the execution plan. If I want to reconfigure a part of, the, of this, so I want to send a message, say, OK, now change the data rate, right? When does this message arrive? Does it arrive while five items are here, or maybe zero items are here? Do we guarantee reception and so on? And again, I'll discuss this more late, uh, later when we have a, a, a more solidly defined example. So uh, <coughs> why is this? Uh, is everything OK? Yeah? OK, just like. Why is this? Uh, OK, so I already said this one. So shared state. So, um, so several components might need to share a state, right? So, for example, we might use the same data rate. We might have different packet lengths and so on. Um, so what do we do here? So if you look at these two things, can you tell me what is a shared state? It's not that easy. You have to read through all these lines of code and figure out where it is. And so this is the shared state. So you use this thing here <coughs> in various pieces of, of it there. But it's not very obvious what is the shared state, right? So if you, now you're worrying if you change a functionality of one component, how is this going to affect the functionality of another component? And also, when will you change it? And how is it going to propagate? So unless you understand what, what is the shared state, you don't really know there could be all sorts of bugs that pop out there. And this is, I guess, a general software engineering problem. But here it com comes out because of the, uh, all this aggressive optimization that we need to do anyway. So we can't use any programming tools. We have to be very careful about the performance. <coughs> uh, the second thing is separation of control and data flow. So this is an example of uh, Sora code again. And so there's like a reset implementation in one of these data blocks, right? And what it does, it actually sends something to the next block, right? And if you look at this next one, next two, next three, I mean, basically, it needs to know who is downstream, and what to do to the control downstream. Whereas if you think of portability of this code, right, uh, the block itself shouldn't know who is it connected to. right? If you want to make it portable, if you connect several blocks and you want to, to, to change the order of execution of the block, it has to be at a high level. If it's inside the block, you need to remember that it's in the block and you need to change it when you get to the point that you're, you're reusing it. So that's another example of, that, of the problem. Then there is uh, verbosity of the code. So one of the problems with um, uh, C and C++ is basically 
the Sora guys that have this uh, clever idea of embedding everything in a C++ template, which then allows you lots of optimizations to be hidden from the user's side. But the problem is that then, because you have to use all these templates, you need to respect the uh, syntax of C++ and the templates. And so basically, all this is just the definition of a function, right? So you have to say there's local context, it's uh, inherited from this, this is read-only, there's another reference local. So all this is just the definition of which, I mean, okay, we can do now in one line. And, and still you have lots of shared states, it's not clear immediately what it's doing. So if you want to do fast prototyping, right, as we will do later, you know, I will actually write the code in front of you in three lines. If you want to take this code and do something like that, it will take you days, right, because you need to understand what's there, figure out all the bad template errors that you get, and so on. Right? So that's another problem. <coughs> uh, manual optimizations. So basically, um, lo lots of times you want to be very quick. So you want to write some lookup tables, and I think Kuhn mentioned that. Um, so the problem is that these lookup tables, this is how they look like, right? So you have something which is doing some creation of some lookup table, and which is supposed to do something which in standard, this is a standard definition of the thing. So ideally what you want to do, if I give you a, a Wi-Fi uh, 811A standard, you want to look at the standard, you want to look at the code and see that this is equal to that, right? And right now from here, it's kind of tricky to understand right, what's going on. And I'll show you an example how we can do that. So you do want to minimize the effort for a programmer from a standard or from a conceptual implement, uh, idea to actually writing it down. I will explain in two slides. Yeah, so I'll explain in two slides. Just, uh, yeah, I'll spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, well, it's a good point. But I think in two slides I have a, a complete exa exa example of this one. I just This is here just to say that this is the deficiency, right? So <clears throat> another thing is also vectorization, which comes to the, back to the execution model. So now it's beneficial to process items in chunks, right? So I might want to have, uh, let me see, let's, let's go here. I might want to get uh, 50 items and do the invert channel and then pass them here and do decoding. And why do I want to do that? Because if I copy from here to here, I have less mem copy, then I have um, uh, a local cache locality and so on. But the problem is how do I know that I don't, what is the size of this chunk? If I take too much data, then I'm not, I'm going to uh, uh, use too much data from top, which should have gone to this other decoder, which belong to bucket, right? So I don't know how much data I should process in this block and how much I should do here. And the, it's not the job of a programmer to specify there. So a, a compiler should infer how can it optimize the code with respecting the semantics you give here. So again, I'll, I'll give more details of this later. This is just the kind of the problems. And uh, my own frustration from, from my own experience was that I've implemented several physical error algorithms in FPGA, uh, and basically I was always, it was pretty much impossible to reuse them. I pretty much had to almost write from scratch if I had to use them in another uh, design because of all the timing issues that I guess you that programmed FPGAs before would understand because you need to uh, kind of make sure that all integrates well. The integration, the API is really bad. And for Sora I had a problem once I was trying to uh, create a smaller example from what I had and I wrote like three blocks in a row and I spent two hours f debugging which state I haven't, I have forgotten to initialize so nothing works. Right. So I had to go and try and figure out, and if you go and execute the template code, you don't know where it's going, and you're like, I don't understand really, this one of the things I have initialized, I just took it out of the code, port, copied the subset in my own code, and then it took, took me two hours to figure it out. So, so I want tools to allow me to write reusable code, and then I want to incrementally build more complex systems. I build something today, and then I, tomorrow I add more of it, and I reuse, and I give it to you, and you reuse, and so on. So that's the goal of this, uh, of this project. Right. So this is what we designed then. We designed this uh, new programming platform, which includes a language and a compiler. And uh, so the code is written in this high-level language, and uh, you just want to explain conceptual parts of the design. And then compiler deals with low-level optimization. And ideally, we want the same code to compile on different platforms, and we are not there yet. We can do optimizations if you have multiple cores, you have different sizes of cores, and so on. There's some uh, flexibility in that, but we would like to target FPGAs or DSPs or other platforms. And then the challenges we had to solve is like design the programming languages abstraction that are intuitive and expressive so that when you see these, uh, the algorithm of, of Wi-Fi, you see the code and it looks straightforward. Right? You can understand everything. And hopefully, I'll give you lots of examples, I'll persuade you that we are there, right? so you can understand things. And then uh, 
you can design the efficient multi uh, compilation schemes based on these abstractions. Right? If I give you abstractions that are nice to explain, I can give you the PDF right, from, from Wi-Fi, but you can't really do much with it in compilation. right? So it has to be really efficient in compilation. Now, this is a general programming problem, right? So you can say everyone would like that. Whatever your domain of interest is, you want to do this, right? Now, but we are interested in wireless. And so we try to explore, uh, uh, the, exploit the special features of wireless, uh, basically, which are a large degree of separation between data and control flow, which doesn't happen in, let's say, map reduced programs, right? Or, uh, and then uh, we want to understand how some of these, I mean, their way they're written, we can actually optimize them because they use lots of binary operations and so on. So we try to uh, learn, no, use our knowledge of the wireless design of the algorithms to design these abstractions. Okay. So <coughs> our choice is domain-specific language. Uh, so the question for you: Who knows? Uh, can you give me an example of some domain-specific languages? Have you heard of any? Okay. Hints. Make or SQL. <coughs> so make, you want to make a code, right? So this is a domain-specific language. SQL as well is a domain-specific language, right? You write queries, it's very well made for database. So lots of them there. And some of them, I guess, you, you know, write general purpose code in SQL. But, uh, you know, there's some of them are more useful, some of them are less useful. And uh, the benefits of these languages is they capture the specifics of a task. So that, again, which allows compiler to optimize better. So that's something we will uh, hope to... Uh, to get with, with, with this one. Uh, so again, why is wireless co code special? So wireless is special because there's lots of signal, uh, lots of signal processing. Uh, and there are lots of signal processing elements that are um, predictable. So if you think of uh, Fourier transform, so you get a chunk of data, you do a sum over this chunk of data, and you emit the chunk of data. There is no, uh, the processing does not depend on data. Right? Or you, do, you take scrambling, coding, decoding. We'll, we'll go through some of these examples later if you're not familiar. But basically, <coughs> there, is, there is no control in there. Whatever data I give you, you will just do the same algorithm. There's no ifs. There is no, uh, no decision based on data. Right? And there's lots of code is like that. So we want to use that. And so that will help us optimizing. Right? Because we know these control flow parts are actually high level. But then there are control flow elements. But they're kind of distinguished nicely. So you can have rate adaptation, uh, header processing, uh, uh, some kind of, uh, I don't know, if you want to implement things with mix of phi and, and um, uh, say if you look at LT, you have OFDMA, needs to decide how to do scheduling in these things. So there's lots of, you could have lots of control. It's not like a simple stream, uh, streamline pipelining, pro, uh, as you'll see in some of the examples. Or as you saw in this, this example I gave before with the, with the box connected, right? Yeah, go ahead. True, wire network, I guess, uh, they, they have a little bit less uh, uh, throughput demand. In a sense, OK, if you, if you look at signal processing, it's done at 40 uh, mega data samples per second, uh, mega complex numbers. So when you go and do, you have to do lots of uh, signal processing, like Fourier transform, lots of uh, real-time analysis in there. Whereas in networking, classical networking, you do different type of things. You do lookups at uh, header size, and you do it very even faster rate. You do 40 gigabits per second, right? But you do different type of tasks. You don't do single processing, right? You do matches, lookup tables for uh, routing uh, tables and so on, right? So that's the difference between networks. Similar question could be like, what's the difference between this and uh, multimedia, right? And again, uh, multimedia has a little bit less um, uh, control flow. Because maybe you don't, you know, there, there is some control flow, and I don't know that well. The, by, for example, if you do MPEG decoding or encoding, right, there is a little bit of of of, of, of rules there, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, it's not as there's not as much control flow as is in wireless, right? So if you know, if you ask me whether any other existing language could be used here, I haven't seen anyone, and I have. Uh, we can discuss it afterwards uh, once I go through it. What are the benefits of this? compared to specific other solutions. But in particular, for, wire, for wired, it's a different types of operations you do. You don't do all this kind of, uh, and I think you might be able to use this in uh, our, our solution for wired networks, but I'm not sure if it's, you know, our goal is really for this community to have something that everyone can use. 
and it's better to be focused, I think, and if you have a good, uh, good target, uh, then to go too far. We'll see later. I mean, maybe it becomes useful or not. We'll see. Other questions? No. <laughs> I'll give you loads of examples. Please refer. I'm just trying to kind of give a bit of motivation, but it's difficult to illustrate everything straight away. Yeah, one question. Uh, was it easy for you to define sort of requirements that Zilia should meet? Because there are sort of, uh, already some kind of existing uh, tools and mechanisms, but uh, which help you to make it better kind of a stuff. Would, would it have been possible for you to take this initiative with some Oh, that was very much personal. So I was using FPGAs, and then I moved to Sora, and I had to throw away all my code, which was the first uh, uh, shock. And the, well, I knew about it, but I was I was desperate for that because of everything I knew. I had to learn a new platform and new tools. But then it was also thinking like, if I write the code now, how do I write it? Given all my previous bad experiences with FPGAs, how do I write it to make sure it's portable and so on? And I was talking to uh, one of the programming languages guys who we happen to have lots in the building and over the coffee, and he said, why don't you tell me how do you program these things? So it was very much the interaction there, and then we kind of started over there. But it was just my personal uh, realization that I'm not, I don't have anything suitable for a task. And maybe there was another way. I don't know. We can discuss afterwards. But I couldn't, we, I mean, even now when I think back, I don't think there's tool that could do as much at the moment of the ones I know of as we can do now. And hopefully I'll persuade you into that by the, by the end of the talk. And I'll give you loads of examples. Right? I'm, I'm starting like examples in a minute. So, <coughs> uh, so okay. So this was the the programming model. So the programming model should kind of describe this, right? When I tell you data goes here, and then until we detect a carrier, and then it goes here, and then it does channel estimation, uh, and then it goes here, and then does this thing. So this is a kind of programming model that we want to describe. And again, I'll give more details, but I don't want to go. I don't want to uh, give anything else in my code. Just this, which you can all understand and agree that is kind of Wi-Fi. <laughs> and then, for example, and that comes back uh, to the to the quick example of lookup tables we had before. So this was the example of the scrambler where I gave this uh, unparsable code on the previous slide. <laughs> so this is IEEE uh, 811 uh, scrambler. So I'll explain you later what scrambler does. I'll do you a demo of what it can do. But basically, for now, uh, this is the simple state machine. Okay. So this is initialized to, I think, all ones. Okay? And this x is a delay element. So think of these all ones. Uh, so no, it can't be all ones. One is 0. Some, they're initialized to something. Okay. So what happens is that uh, these guys, so, this is a, so they just shift. As a clock ticks, they shift. Right? So x1 become, x2 becomes x1, x3 becomes x2, x4 becomes x3, uh, and so on. Right. And then x1 becomes the XOR of x4, x7, right? And so this, is, this happens in a loop, right? It's a kind of state machine for every new input. And then input, whatever input you send, it just gets XORed with this and gets out. OK. So this is what, the, and this picture defines Scrambler in Wi-Fi specs. So I just copy paste this from IEEE specification, right? Uh, and then this is a kind of the way people Kind of sometimes defined. They say the first one becomes the sum of the uh, the, the zero element, the seventh and fourth, right? <coughs> so this is Zilia code, okay? So this this is what we actually write to make it compile. So you basically say uh, this temporary element is the XOR of. I hope I didn't put the wrong picture here. Maybe it's a different state machine. Six is temp. Yeah, it should have been zero and three. Maybe I'm. No, sorry, this is 0 and this is 3, just counting the other way around. So 0 and 3, it goes there, right? So this would be 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Sorry for that, I didn't think of the. So this would be x6 becomes the XOR of these two, right? So this in this line here. Everything else is just shifted by 1. And then you XOR the input, which is x, with temporary. And what is x? We just take one input, OK? We calculate the output by XORing these two, and then we emit input. Uh, why there? So I don't know if you're persuaded, but basically I'm, I'm thinking, I'm saying that this code comes as close as it gets to this description in a, in a pseudocode. 
or actually this is the real code that will compile. As, com as, com as opposed to the other one we had there, as, as opposed to this, this one, which is a kind of lots of, which is doing a lookup table essentially, but I'll show you that later and, and maybe you heard of it. So, so that's part of the, part of the goal of um, what we want to achieve. Uh, and then one more thing to say before we go in there to set the exploitation rights. We don't want to optimize very highly specific DSP libraries. And the reason why we don't do it is because they're like, we, what we don't optimize is, for example, in Wi-Fi we use um, FFT and Viterbi decoding which are written by Sora guys. We don't touch them, right? You could write them together, but the po point is that they're the same blocks used in many standards. So we kind of reuse them. Uh, and, and the reason is that writing an efficient FFT is a research area on its own. And a lot of people that did it, right? So we can just borrow from these things. Uh, they're like the CPU efficient CPU libraries, FPGA guys that give you these blocks. So while you could integrate that in here, it's kind of orthogonal thing to, to, to write some of these blocks. But I'll point out that we only use these two blocks in the whole Wi-Fi design, which are kind of out, outside blocks, which are highly specialized. All the scramblers, interleavers, encoders, everything else you see in the code is written by SSUA code. And again, you could write these as well, but they're, it's a different kind of optimization you do there. OK, so now I'll give you uh, a flavor of the programming language. So I'll just explain you the programming language and hopefully explain you how we can write all these constructs. And I'll go in detail to the Wi-Fi example and show you what kind of things we, we can extract there. And I mean, I guess this is the kind of the key part to gain better understanding of, uh, of uh, what we can do once you have a little bit of knowledge of language. I won't give you too many details, right? So later, if you're interested, you can pick it up. But I think it's generally instructive to see uh, how you can uh, write these kind of languages. And, and another thing, and another message I want to uh, give is that actually it can be useful, right? If a lot of times, if engineers or designers try to do something, they'll take the existing things. They don't look broader to see if they can actually improve the tools or understand if there are better tools they can use to do things. And for me, this was an interesting exercise to realize that actually, if you spend some time thinking about the tools and write a good tool, you can make your life much easier in the longer term. And so that's why I want to give you a bit more details to give you a flavor of how you can do that and, and that it's not really impossible, right? It's actually something that you can do yourselves as well if you ever come up with, with that kind of problem. <clears throat> so, so what's the principle? So now, okay, now I'm describing Xeria um, basically uh, language. So the whole system has two parts. There's a language which describes what you want to do. And there's a compiler which makes sure you can actually run this efficiently. So the language, uh, the, the design has two layers. So lower layer is actually an imperative code like C, something like C, which is uh, <coughs> a subset of C. And uh, so parts of it look like MATLAB and so on. So uh, we basically, uh, this is something that will compile relatively easy to any of the platform. So we don't do all the features of C. We kind of take uh, deliberately simplify things. And the reason is we want to use only operations that can efficiently be, um, that can be efficiently optimized, right? And I'll give you more details on that. And the uh, important thing is you can write any C function you want and plug it in. So it's very easy, right? If you miss something, you just write C function. The problem is this C function might not be portable then, but that's up to you to decide. And uh, you can bring, make your own libraries, you can change them, and so there's kind of flexibility there. But yeah, more on this later. Now it's just important to have this kind of. <clears throat> and then the second layer is um, uh, high layer, which is the kind of, forget about this monadic. This is if you're in the PL, you like this term very much nowadays. But basically, it's um, a language for specifying this stream processor, so for specifying these boxes and controls between boxes. And that allows us to enforce clear separation between control and uh, data flow, which, I, which, I, which is what I kind of hopefully convey that what we want to have. And again, I'm coming into details now. So uh, just to reiterate that bit. So, uh, so then we, the second part is the um, runtime that implements the low-level execution model. Uh, and the other thing is also, which is important, is that by having this, uh, the, the way we describe these languages, and you'll see later, allows you to do optimizations. Again, it'll come in more, in more details and, and, and examples later. OK, so this is kind of uh, the first uh, thing about the, pro the, the, the programming language itself. So we have these boxes. You saw them before. 
And uh, <coughs> so we are processing streams. So we have wireless stream either coming from Mac as lots of bits that we want to do something with them and send them in the air, or we have something coming from the air and we want to convert them somehow and send it to Mac. That's the kind of a setup we think about. And so the most obvious thing is something called stream transformer. It's basically you uh, take some input bits, some number of input bits, do something on them and output them. Like Fourier transform is a great example. You take, let's say, 64 uh, complex numbers, you transform and you output 64 or 128, whatever you want. And this runs forever. Okay, so the, 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 the transformer is something that stays there and forever does whatever you said it does. There is no control in it, it just runs there. And then the other abstraction on the high level is computer. So computer is also simple. It takes input stream and does something to the input stream and outputs. But doesn't do that forever. It does it until it wants to finish. When it wants to finish, and that's determined by the code inside, then it says, I'm done. And also, in addition to saying, I'm done, it says, I have some output to give you, okay, whatever it is. So one example could be packet detection, right? A packet detection, I'm getting input stream, I'm searching for a pattern, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not outputting anything because I don't care. Before I find a pattern, I don't want to output anything. So I'm searching for a pattern, and once I found a pattern, maybe I give some information like frequency offset or something, right? So that's the, that, this is called a computer. So what we argue now is that by com combining these two, we can define any control flow we want, and it will satisfy all our criteria. So these are the two blocks we use. Okay, so how do we compose these blocks? So um, there are two types of compositions. Uh, there is the vertical arrow, which basically says whatever goes out of C1 sent to T1. <coughs> so uh, it's just a simple thing. It's kind of, I guess, obvious. Whatever comes out of here, you, do, you can put an FFT, and then you can put something else here, uh, channel equalizer or something. And everything will go through it. And then the other thing that you can do is this uh, semicolon, which is horizontal binding, control part binding. And so what it does, it says, okay, once this guy is done, move to that part. So what happens is, in, intuitively, how, our, how we should execute this is, first we go and put all the data here, <coughs> right? And then once this guy is done, then the data will go this way. So it will not go anymore to this one, once this guy is done, right? And so another interesting thing to observe is we can actually, it's a very kind of well-typed language in the sense that if you look at this bit, like we have a computer and transformer. So if you put a computer and transformer, if a computer finishes its computing, it will stop and, will, it, and, and it will move there. So if you look at the aggregation of these two, this is type the computer. So if you, if you aggregate a computer and transformer, they become a computer because they can stop. If you aggregate two transformers uh, vertically, they are still a transformer, so they never stop. If you aggregate the computer semicolon transformer, it becomes all transformer because this thing will never stop. This guy will do, will do things. Eventually, this guy will do things, but this guy will never stop, so it will become a transformer. So it's easy to compose these blocks because once you compose them, they still become, they still stay computers or transformers. And they kind of intuitively correspond to things you might want to do in this, as we saw in the previous, uh, in the Wi-Fi example, and I think I'll give you more uh, there. Okay, so let's see how we do this scrambler example that we mentioned before. So this is the example of a scrambler. Again, as I said, this is wrongly Enumerate should be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? So this is the entire Wi-Fi is basically a <coughs> The entire Wi-Fi is, uh, no, it's a computer because it stops. A packet is... Uh, but the stream is keeping on coming in. Yeah, you can do it. Uh, you can make it a... So you'll put a repeat around the computer to make it a proper transformer. I'll show you that. You're right, yes. You can, yeah. So a scrambler is a good example of a transformer. It, it keeps on processing data. So uh, so we showed a little bit what it does. So basically it takes data from input, does these things, and output. So, so this is how we define a computer. Uh, sorry, the computer. So this is the computational method. It's not necessarily only a computer. It's slightly... Uh, so if you remember this two-layer two thing, there's expressive language, which describes the CLI code, and there's this computational language, which describes this control flow. So this comp here is from the computational language. It could be either computer or transformer. So sorry for this notational thing. So all in here is a big, either transformer or a computer. In this case, it's going to be a transformer. And I'll tell you why in a bit. Right. So then we design some variables. These are local variables. I mean, OK, it's similar to whatever programming language you like. You just say, OK, this is a variable that we use. 
and uh, it's an array of bits, and then we use this comma just uh, 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 to just to, to uh, denote these are bits. Then you know you can have arrays, and you can have a usual kind of things. And this is a local state for this uh, transformer. Nobody else can access it, right? It's it's valid here and inside. So then, <coughs> okay, it has all these types. It can use constants and kind of usual programming language still. Now you have these computers. So how do you compose a computer? To create a, co a, co a transformer com a computer, you use other transformers of computers. But you have to start from somewhere, right? So we have these basic computers and transformers that do main stuff. And they're here, right? So we have, uh, sorry, we have this, this guy is, um, <coughs> let's, let's start with take. So what is take? Take is a computer. So what it does, it does, it takes an input from, from a stream, right? And, and puts it in this variable here. And I'll explain to you in a second how we compose them. But take for now, it's a special element that takes from a stream and gives it to whoever wants it. And puts it in this variable x, which is then used in later. Then uh, emit, emit takes this variable and puts it in a stream. Okay, and I'll explain to you again in a second how that composes. And then this do thing is a way to put in imperative code. Imperative code, again, you can think of C code or MATLAB code. So you write whatever you want in this code. So this is our C-like or MATLAB-like code that does this actual operational bit. And it's encapsulated in, uh, uh, in do. So do makes it, lifts it to become um, a, a, a computer, right? So, OK, this is the MATLAB imperative code. So l let's make this a bit more clear with all these computers and transformers. So what I do now. I'm, I'm saying this is a, this all this thing is a transformer, and intuitively a scrambler is a transformer. It just does the scrambling forever, just takes and so on. So how do we make it a transformer? So if I go back to the previous story with with these diagrams, how do we compose all that? So here it is. So <coughs> let's start with take. Okay. So take is a block that takes an input from a data stream. Okay. It finishes immediately, and it gives its input to the next guy in a in a par. So this is like in, a, in this after semicolon. So there's a semicolon, like we said before. So basically, this guy takes the x and gives it to do. Okay? So do takes this x and does any C code you want. right? So this is, and then it gives it to emit. Right? And emit puts this back on a data stream. Right? So inside here, x is not a data stream. This is a, some local variable that's passed. And this is essentially how we decouple control and data flow. Right? So they, uh, the control is basically you decide where this data goes. But inside this block, right, you basically put take to, to, to get one element in. You do something with it in this imperative code, and then you put it back on data flow. So you're doing data processing inside. The, the, the whole thing will tell you where data goes, but once you get your data item, right, this is here, you can do anything. But you don't have to worry about control flow. You got your data item, you do your FFT, you do whatever you want. And then once you're done, you give it back to Dataflow. And you let these blocks worry about how the control will go and so on. So if you look at this thing, so there's take, semicolon, which is this kind of composition, do, semicolon, which is this kind of composition, emit. This, is, this sequence here is a simple set of computers that perform operation on one single data item, which they take one bit. This is one bit. They do operation on one bit and emit out. And all of them can be composed as a one single computer, right? You can see them as a computer. Now, how do I make it? I want this to work forever. How do I make it a, a transformer that will work forever? I'll just put a repeat around it. So repeat this special thing that says, oh, just repeat this forever. Okay? <laughs> and so I have this repeat on around this. So what it's going to do, every time this finishes, it's going to reinitialize, and reinitialize, and reinitialize, and so on. <laughs> so I'm going to do it again and again. So this, hopefully, I mean, the code, I would hope, it sounds like intuitive. You know, you say, take some data item, do something, emit data item. And you put it and do it forever repeat, right? Now, what is important here is basically to uh, convey to you how this actually can be composed on these basic elements we had initially, right? Everything works in this basic element. And we all treat them as basic elements. You don't need to understand what happens behind the thing, but that's how we get this control and data uh, flow separation. And maybe this partially answers the question, but I'll, uh, there'll be more examples. Uh, and so, how do we write the whole program? So you write a code like this, okay? And then you say read and write. So read is the input to the whole thing. And uh, so that comes either it's your radio or and write is maybe your um, bit stream sending to IP or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe this is going to be for the, for the receiver, this is going to be a radio board and this is going to be IP stack. For the transmitter, this is going to be IP stack and the radio board. 
and but the nice thing is now we can play with it. We can put file in there. We can put dummy things. You know, it's just part of the uh, completely automatized. So you can test with inputs from file. We store the inputs in file. Test them again. Change our algorithm. You know, we can do lots of nice things. And now back to your question about the uh, receiver. We can say a receiver is a computer that actually is finite. Detects a packet, receives the whole packet, and ends. Right? But we can put a repeat around it. So every time we have a packet, we dump a packet, and then repeat again. So then it becomes a, a, a transformer. But intuitively, a Wi-Fi receiver is a computer. It gives you a packet. Uh, yeah. Right? Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to discuss this. This is a very simple example. It could be multiple takes, or it could be a take of, um, of an array. So, and that's precisely that's one of the optimizations we, will, we are doing. Now, I'll go in more details there. This is very, yeah, this is trivial. So this is very inefficient if you want to compile. But that's how I'll show you that we can optimize this. And that's kind of one of the examples I go through and show how it works. <coughs> uh, so, so computational language primitives, now that hopefully you understand the basics. So, um, so these computational language primitives are this repeat, take, and emit, and define the control flow. And uh, there are two groups, transformers and computers. So these are the transformers. <coughs> so perhaps the simplest transformer is MAP. This is something you see in other languages as well, where basically says, this is, I, I give a function which takes one integer and returns one integer. <coughs> and then MAP, basically, on every input I have, do this function and give it out, right? So that's a simple thing. This is like take, do, emit. It's just map. <laughs> now, repeat can be more complex, right? So for repeat, you can take something and say, I take, and only if it's larger than zero, I emit one. You can do whatever you want, right? As long as you compose it in the right way. You know, maybe count only those, or only those that are larger than zero, emit one. Whatever you want in repeat. It doesn't have to have regular input or regular output. It could be anything you want, right? So repeat is more general than map. But map is faster. So we'll see how we can transform. Uh, <coughs> then uh, we have computers. So useful computer is while. <coughs> so while something is done, like for example, while uh, uh, CRC is larger than zero, I search, sorry, it shouldn't be in like preamble here. While, while I haven't found the preamble, search for preamble. So I have this again. This is a control element. And my imperative code is here. So here is my data code where I don't worry about about basically a control much anymore. I still could, but it's a different way. I'll show you again examples here. But here I'm just looking for data. And the control is here, right? Or if then else. So maybe, you know, I'm looking at if my rate is uh, one half, my coding is one half, I'll use encoding one half, otherwise I'm encoding two over three, right? And so these are all control elements. This, this is uh, the imperative code. It doesn't have to be, right? In this example, it is an imperative code. It could just be another computer or transformer or something like that. And we also have take emit, which you see. There's a for as well. You can see for repeat 10 times instead of while, pretty much like any programming language. But this is at the computer level. So this is the language used, uh, used to this describe the control at a high level. Now, expression language is really for data processing. <coughs> so this is the mix of C and MATLAB that can be directly linked to any C function. And you can think of it as pretty much a subset that we dump directly in C. You can, you can recognize this code. I'll show you uh, some example. Where you, you look at your code, you look at this code, I'll say, oh, this is it, right? Which is good for debugging if you usually have bugs in this, this, this part of code. And these are the data types we support. This is just the basic one. So we need these kind of fixed point arithmetics because fixed point arithmetics is what you can do fast. So if you want to do, uh, if you want to do floating point in MATLAB, it's good, but you're never going to do 40 megabits per second or mega samples per second. So we also have double, but you don't want to use it uh, very often. We have structs for uh, uh, simpler programming if you want to pass complex data structure. And there are arrays. And arrays are useful because you can aggregate things. As, as you pointed out, you might take more stuff. And I'll show you later a bit more about the examples. And so here is just an example of an imperative code to demystify. It's nothing special, right? You can also have for loops in imperative code. You can have if and then and so on. The main difference is that if you put a for loop and if loop in imperative code, we don't, we don't optimize it really much, right? We cannot vectorize, we cannot loop. But there, there are things we, can, we cannot do. It's, for example, you're just, you, uh, you want to build some coefficients and you want to put some numbers in an array, right? So there's no control loop there. It's really a local operation where you're filling in an array with something, right? And for this algorithm, you need a for loop. 
right? So it's, it's not control data suppression. It's just describing the data algorithm, and there is nothing really of control. There is a local thing if you think of control, but it's just a for loop that fills in something. So you can still use all these things, but it's a different um, nature, right? You, you're expressing a specific DSP algorithm. You're not doing the connecting the control way. And uh, <coughs> so, and then uh, it, what, what is, I guess, important is that if we invent this weird C, uh, language, we can say, oh, I don't want to use it because I can't implement this or I don't have. So actually, it's really simple because we dump everything we compile into C code, right? So the way to link, I could write my own function. For example, this is an example of function we wrote to do SIMD um, sub subtraction. So you put two arrays. This is doing C equals A minus B, right? And this function is just going to be compiled into this uh, C code. So as long as you provide the C function with this signature, Everything is compiled, or runs. You know, you're you're responsible for that. And we wrote lots of these functions. Basically, we rely on Sora library. Sora has an excellent library, very fast, with uh, lots of SMD uh, operations, F15, Bitter B, fixed point uh, trigonometry visualization. That's already there. So if you get the the code from uh, GitHub, you get the links to all this. You need to install Sora to use it, but it's linked naturally, and you don't have to do anything. Just use all these functions. That's what we do for our Wi-Fi receiver. <clears throat> so this kind of and you know you can link your favorite library if you want later, right? If you want to move to new radio, I don't know, we haven't done it, but you know you can take all these libraries from new radio and port your code pretty easily, I suppose. We haven't done it, but I believe, right? And any, uh, but these are local things that you have to optimize for um, for the for the architecture. And we don't do like SMD. So SMD is uh, vector operations in modern CPUs. In case you some of you don't know, like SSC instructions or AMX, whatever they're called, the AVX. So these things, I mean, their people worked on how to vectorize C code automatically and so on. You can rely uh, GCC and Visual Studio C compiler. They do their job sometimes. You can rely on that. You can, but this is something we don't do. So we just provide interfaces. So you can put any other optimization you want there, right? So one way is to put these libraries for different platforms, different OSs, different compilers yourself, or rely on a compiler to do it, or put another tool to do it, whatever you want, right? This is just an interface. OK, so a few frequently asked questions, and then I guess we can go for a break. Uh, <clears throat> so the first question is, why designing, defining a new language? Why not for, for, for uh, the imperative part of the code? I've, hopefully, I persuaded you, and I mean, I'm still going to try to persuade you in the next, uh, what, three hours that this is the right way to go. But at least the imperative code is where we write our DSP algorithms. Why don't you use C or MATLAB or something like that? And the reason is uh, pretty much. Um, opportunistic because we design it, we need to write a compiler for it, right? So we don't, we're not going to write a compiler for the full C because it's very tedious, uh, or also for the full MATLAB. We try to support the features we could so that we make it work, and I think it's pretty useful. Nevertheless, I mean, we have uh, a, a rich set of features, and also we can implement the whole Wi-Fi, lots of parts of LT and so on. And, uh, and, and another reason is we want to make sure we compile efficiently. We don't want to use malloc, we don't want to use uh, recursions and all this stuff, right? Because uh, although recursion might be even possible, I'm not sure. But um, they're not fundamental for wireless, and then it will slow down your code. So really focus on the features that will uh, make sure that we can actually implement all the modern wi wireless physical layers, but they're still fast, and we know how to compile them fast. So that was the key argument. So how do you share state? The answer is we don't share state, and um, I think it's not disabled. You could, but that's what we try to avoid. And all the code we've written, there's no shared state. There's st st shared can, state can be shared, and I'll show you an example, explicitly by, by, by passing it around. And uh, so other things we use, these are functional language techniques. And it's a kind of uh, more just an uh, intuition, <laughs> an idea about the functional language is not really important here. So we have. When you compile down, you create shared state, right? Because it's needed for efficiency. You want to avoid copying and stuff like that. So yeah. like Uh, actually, um, we do lots of copying, and we do have some penalty of efficiency, but we're still fast enough for Wi-Fi. We, we have lots of optimizations to do there. So that's something we haven't done because it wasn't fundamental. As soon as we saw that we are, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 percent off Sora and above Wi-Fi, we stopped, right? But there, these are future student projects and so on. Right, right, true. but. Um, the point is that there's an interesting trade-off, right? So how much do you waste by passing the state? And the reason is if you vectorize, this is all in one. So if suppose I pass on, I do operation of 64 elements. 
So I, I, and then I do a mem copy. I amortize it so much over 64 months that you won't even see it often. So I'm willing to pay this penalty, but having my programming model much more clean. And this is an interesting trade-off. And we don't see big penalty on these things. But it's true that if you have a shared state, you still would need to do at least one copy, I guess, or a few copies in our, in our, in our program. And we don't, do, we don't completely eliminate. We'll still have to explore how much we can eliminate. But because of the vectorization, everything, the performance hit is low, but we actually get much better. Uh, we get better, better programmability and better. And I think I have one example right after this to, to illustrate the difference. Uh, so OK, quickly, this thing. So basically, this is some kind of inlining you can do in functional languages. Let's skip because it's not really. Uh, and then this is another weird thing that I'm also uh, worrying myself. So why doing this and not this? OK, so uh, has anyone programmed Haskell? No, they didn't expect that. You have? OK, good. So they have something like this. And basically, this is an immutable state. So basically, it says x is, uh, will not be changed. right? And that allows you to avoid copying, because then you know it's not changed, so you can do some optimizations. Uh, I still don't think it's very necessary, but half of my team was a, a big, our, our Husk, big Husky believer, so we had to be, you know, I think it's not too bad anyway. Uh, so, OK, so there is the thing about passing state, right? And this is a question for all of you. So let's say, I, I, I'm not sure you'll be able to answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a try. So let's say we have this thing as frequency mixing, something with doing some processing, no control inside. There's some equalizer and decoding. And then this decoder here receives inside some new frequency. So it has to send a message here to say uh, new reconfiguration message received, right? So uh, what you can do, you can have a shared state, which is called new frequency. So when this guy writes to this state, then these guys will read the state and change it, right? But we don't allow shared state. And um, the reason why I argue the state state is not good is now if I do that, right? So the question for you is, if this guy changes right, the frequency, when will that change really happen semantically? I'm having the stream, right? And I'm executing. So maybe I have five elements here, three elements here, two elements here, right? Or maybe I have 0, 0, 2. I don't know, right? So it's down to the execution model. I don't want to specify that. So now you send this message, right? So this message has to come when? Immediately after the last processing bit? Or uh, after three or after five? How do you specify that? Then, say again? Well, I don't know. It's actually kind of, that's a very good, uh, very good uh, assumption. So my question for you is really, how would you do this with the abstractions we introduced, if you still remember them all, without the shared state? <coughs> Anyone has an idea? That's true, but the problem is, I mean, even if, if you think of FPGA terms, this is a pipeline, right? In FPGA, there'll be lots of elements inside. But that really depends how you or someone else implement this equalizer. How many elements are in here? They're already screwed, because now you receive this guy, and you, already ch you haven't changed the frequency for those guys. So it's not well-defined, right? Depends on your execution mode or, or what you are implementing here, and we don't want that. So how can, and we, we don't allow shared state. So how would you do it without shared state with our primitives? It's a difficult question. I mean, if anyone has an idea, OK, I'll give you the solution. So it's not that, I mean, one, if, you, if you get experience with it. So it's basically just a repeat around these things, right? So we do this, we do this, we do this. And at the end of it, this guy is going to be uh, a, a computer. And this computer will stop when it receives the state and then send it back. So now, how are we going to execute it? I don't know. It doesn't matter, but it's very well defined. Right? And it's very well defined in the sense that when this guy finishes, we should change the state. So it means that at the last element, no, no elements should be in here. Right? It's very well defined semantics. So we do like repeat, and we say, this whole thing, frequency mixing, equalizer, and decoding, is a big pipeline, or the, 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 the par thing. So there's like these things are together. And the frequency mixing has a state. Well, it's not a state. It's a parameter. New frequency, right? So when, and this guy will stop when the decoding returns. And the return value is going to be ret. So we assign the new frequency to ret, ret to new frequency, and repeat. And now, 
the semantics of our program tells us there should be no other thing here. So once we receive the last element that, that, that sent the coding, and precisely as you said, we, don't, we should not affect anything afterwards. We first change it and then take the new element. Now, again, execution model is a different story. We need to make sure this is done efficiently. So in FPGA terms, we'll make sure there's nothing in pipeline here, or we need to back off and do speculative execution. It's, but at least at the language level, it's very clear. <laughs> right. And so that's one of the reasons, right? Because if you want to do the state, share state, and you want to run over multiple CPUs or FPGAs, what happens, right? And we don't want the specific execution model. But we want to, we can write optimal execution models afterwards. OK, and I think this is a good time for coffee, <coughs> right? <coughs> Should I switch this off now? Yeah, well, we had another name, which was uh, Blink. And then uh, there was an a issue with, and there's another Microsoft research project called Blink. So we had to clear the name. And it's not easy if you're in a company to clear a name. So this is a mountain in Greece uh, next to the place where my quarter lives. So we needed the name fast. <laughs> so no, no, uh, yeah, no, no meaning other than that. If you think of a good meaning, let me know.